This is chapter six, lecture one, volcanoes and volcanic hazards. Our goals for this chapter include uh, investigation of different types of volcanoes, where we will look at their style of eruptions, associated rocks, and landforms. We will also look at volcanic hazards of different types, um, specific to different types of eruptions. And we'll investigate how geologists study volcanoes and assess volcanic hazards. So let's begin with Mount St. Helens on uh, the western side of North America. Before the 1980 eruption, which was the last major eruption of Mount St. Helens, the volcano was fairly symmetrical in shape. During the eruption, there was quite a bit of ash. It rose upwards uh, about 25 kilometers. It actually spread um, most notably across Washington, Idaho, and Montana. But people in Michigan at the time got a bit of the ash on their cars as well. It just kept going through the atmosphere and being deposited later throughout a huge part of North America. After the eruption, uh, a lava dome formed within that crater, and it really changed the entire shape of the volcano itself. This volcano is constantly monitored by the United States Geologic Survey. It was at the time, it still is. So let's look at some characteristics of different volcanoes. Not all volcanoes have a classic cone shape, but many of them do. This one will point to the vent where magma has erupted. There's a crater as well within that. Volcanoes can erupt lava or ash. Commonly we see them as hills or mountains, but they can also be erupted from what's called a fissure or a depression, not a hill, kind of a flat area. This fissure photograph is from Hawaii. So we'll look at how a hill capped by volcanic rocks can form. The question here is, is it a volcano? Would we classify it as a volcano? So first of all, we have a fissure. It feeds a lava flow. So you see the lava come out of the fissure, um, over time, there can be erosion around that lava flow. And then the fissure location, um, once it's solidified, is now a dike. And it eventually, with greater erosion, uh, forms as a flat top mesa. It's a hill, but it's not a volcano. It was an over event. It's uh, kind of to the side of that fissure. And here's a real life example. That is in the Hopi Buttes of Arizona. Okay, so more types of volcanoes. This is a scoria cone. It's also called a cinder cone. It's usually mostly made of basalt, mafic material. It can be several hundred meters high. This is the SP crater from a previous lecture as an example. Another volcano type is a shield volcano. Those typically have nice gentle slopes. They're very large over time as they develop. They're usually basaltic in composition. Um, they're gonna have scoria oftentimes and ash in layers as you see here. You could have this thing be a kilometer across or greater. Um, so, this is in Hawaii. Much of Hawaii is just large shield volcanoes, like the Big Island. All right, another type is a composite volcano. Those form pretty nicely symmetrical mountains. And if you were to look at them in cross section, you'd see interlayered lava flows, what we call pyroclastic deposits and mud flows. This could be mostly intermediate in composition, uh, like andesite, 
but it can also contain felsic and mafic rocks. It's a composite of different materials. You can also have a volcanic dome. Uh, like the name suggests, it's a dome-shaped constructed feature. It'll have sol solidified lava with volcanic ash and rock fragments. And it'll have very viscous, felsic, or intermediate magma. So on the left, this is Mount Hood in Oregon. On the right, uh, Mount St. Helens. There's a dome within that in Washington. Well, here's a few different types of eruptions. This is a lava flow. Magma erupts onto the Earth's surface and it flows away, as you can see. With this lava fountain, gas uh, propels molten pieces of lava into the air. With the dome, we have a viscous lava pileup around a vent. And with this eruption column, we have volcanic ash, pumice, rock fragments uh, just ejected into the air at once. So these are actually mafic in composition. These are felsic in composition, and they're going to be a lot more viscous than the mafic uh, volcanoes or um, lava flows. So how do gases affect magma? Well, we'll start off like this. Uh, what happens when you open a soda can if you shake it up? Uh, magma, like soda, contains dissolved gases that include water, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. I hope there's not much sulfur dioxide in soda. Of course, you open that, we release the dissolved gas that's held in by pressure, and it looks like so. As magma rises, like upwards towards the Earth's surface, we see a decrease in pressure, and then gases come out of solution. And you see bubbles, and you can see some explosions that released gas propels the eruption and forms ash. So how does viscosity affect eruptions? I mentioned it in a few previous slides. If an eruption has materials that are more viscous or felsic, they are difficult to flow. They've got like uh, silicon dioxide, uh, those bonds are hard to break, so gas is trapped within them. Less viscous, has a lot less silicon dioxide content, it flows easier, and gas can escape. So felsic magmas contain high amounts of silica, they're more viscous. Mafic magmas contain less amounts of silica, so they're less viscous. You can imagine, and this is Mount St. Helens, and this is in Hawaii, this is much more dangerous to be around because it's explosive once that gas is released that was formerly trapped. So back to scoria cones. Um, these are different rock types that you might see from a scoria cone. The first is vesicular basalt, and that has gas pockets. We call those vesicles. They occur in lava flows and uh, ejected material, such as scoria. You can also have non-vesicular basalt, or as I call it, just basalt. In that case, the magma didn't contain enough gas to form bubbles. So either it didn't start out with gas or it degassed somewhere along the way. And then scoria. You have vesicular basalt or andesite, intermediate in composition, ejected from a vent, such as a lava fountain. Um, you'll have those lava blobs cool and solidify in the air to form cinders. So you can see even more like holes within that particular rock versus vesicular basalt.
All right, features of lava flows. Lava tubes, these are in Hawaii. You can have the surface of a lava flow solidifying as it cools, but below the interior is still moving. The tube itself can drain over time, leaving behind a cave. I once heard a story of a geologist who was walking on top of a lava tube and fell through. Um, she did survive, but she had some really awful burns, so you don't want to do that. She has the scars to this day, of course. And then a'a lava in Hawaii, moving on, breaks apart into fragments as it flows. These people are awfully close to it. Or pahoehoe lava in Hawaii, um, that will form small folds. It's usually fed by a lava tube and it cools nicely further away from the tube's origin. We'll go into scoria cones and basalt flows. So scoria foams form when basaltic magma contains dissolved gas. Uh, magma that contains less gas will reach the surface, perhaps on the side like this, and erupt as a lava flow. We have some that's ejected and gives you scoria itself. Here's some examples in the Galapagos Islands and a lava flow from Oregon, the Newberry Volcano. All right, so here's Hawaii, the big island. It's one, mostly one giant uh, shield volcano, but there's other volcanoes that compose it as well. It's three large volcanoes, um, two smaller volcanoes. So Mauna Loa is the world's largest volcano, essentially, um, because of how far out its boundaries are. What it is, um, it's a fissure fed by dikes, like this is. This volcano is the world's most active. The eruptions are from linear features fed by dikes. So you can see like fluid magma from fissures and scoria cones. All right, um, Mauna Kea is currently inactive at the time of this recording. We could have calderas and shields um, forming from lava lakes that form and then drain or from downward collapse rather than from explosions. So there's an example, um, craters and small calderas within volcanoes like these. All right, so here's some shield volcano eruptions. First off, a fissure eruption. That's when lava flows out of a fissure fed by dikes. And this lava flow is where lava spreads out and flows downhill naturally. We can then have eruption into water. That'll make seawater boil, um, produce steam, and add new land. And that's how we get a pillow basalt. Uh, lava erupts into water, and it forms these rounded shapes called pillows. Those are from the San Juan Islands in Washington. And these are both in Hawaii. All right, flood basalts. Uh, one example of this is the Columbia Plateau. It consists of a thick sequence of basalt flows about 15 million years old. So we got a large volume here. And those are fed by dikes. Some flows are large in volume and they're very extensive. Uh, but some are smaller. So here's the Columbia Plateau. And let's see, this is kind of the extent of it. It's huge. So it covers a very large area. But what are the origin of flood basalts? How might that work? 
our best um, explanation is a rising mantle plume. Perhaps it was mostly solid deep in the mantle. It goes up. Um, it flattens once it hits the lithosphere and it partially melts. It melts the uh, host rock there. It melts the lithosphere. Um, decompression melting is what melts the plume with that drop in pressure. Of course, that melts the adjacent asthenosphere or lithosphere. And that's our source for magma, which can later erupt as a widespread flood basalt. So here's a world map showing you the distribution of flood basalts. Now the Columbia Plateau, probably related to the hot spot that's now beneath Yellowstone. If you just look a little more to the east, that would be Yellowstone. The North Atlantic, um, Greenland, Scotland areas, uh, flood basalts. Let's see, those formed above a hot spot as well. Uh, we have some nice examples in India as well. That erupted around the same time as the extinction of most dinosaurs around 65 million years ago. Siberia as well has an extensive flood basalt. That was an eruption that occurred the same uh, time as a mass extinction that we call the Great Dying around 250 million years ago. I could have been pointing these out. I'll just review them quick. In South America, we have some flood basalts on land and some offshore. Those probably formed when the continent was over a hot spot. In the Afar region, uh, those flood basalts uh, were accompanied by rifting at the junction of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the East Africa Rift. In Kerguelen, you have basaltic eruptions, again related to a hot spot. Oops, go back one. And then the Antong Java, that's the largest oceanic plateau formed over an oceanic hotspot. So the explanation for all of those is quite similar in origin relating to hotspots. We'll look at the hazards associated with basaltic eruptions and think about if the hazard affects areas near the vent or far away from it. So starting off with that lava flow, it definitely changed the landscape to make that area, well, unusable from the way that it was before. This is on the big island of Hawaii. It ate the road, essentially. With volcanic ash, we see that that can reach heights of several kilometers and impact areas far downwind. This is Iceland. And then the lava fountain, actually, that's a little better. Um, most of that material falls back near the vent, but gases are released as well. You really don't want to be breathing this stuff. So other hazards with basaltic eruptions. If you have an eruption near ice sheets or snowy volcanoes, you can melt the ice and cause huge floods. This happened in Iceland. Uh, got half a dozen basaltic volcanoes beneath an ice sheet. And that resulted in a huge amount of sediment deposition in this photo. You can have localized gas hazards, as I kind of hinted at in the last slide. Uh, those would include sulfur dioxide, combining with water to form sulfuric acid, possibly affecting climate, um, as occurred in Lackey, Iceland in 1783. And we'll stop here for this lecture.